For my gift to my mum for Christmas this year, I built her these two mission style side tables. For my gift for you guys, here's some free plans on how to build these. I'm starting with the tabletops, first by breaking down the rough material at the miter saw, then going through the standard dimensioning process at the jointer and thicknesser. With the stock for the tabletop now flat and parallel on two faces and square with one edge, I can resaw it to get the correct thickness and to get more material or more pieces out of this material. Resawing on a bandsaw isn't that scary, but it is something that a lot of people struggle with, particularly starting out. I use the Alex Snodgrass method for setting up a bandsaw. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. And I've had some pretty good success with that method. There are a couple of additional things that uh, I'm not sure whether Alex has covered or maybe they are common sense things if you've been doing this for a while, but otherwise you may not know. This is a 14 inch bandsaw and it can handle up to a three quarter inch blade or 19 mil blade. However, on most smaller bandsaws, the wheels aren't deep enough to really uh, provide the best support for those thicker blades. I have the most success using a half inch blade, which is what I've got on this at the moment, and it's a four or five tooth per inch. I ideally want a three tooth per inch, but it's hard to get that in 12 mil. Additionally, it's also a bimetal blade. Uh, they cost a little bit more, but they last a heck of a lot longer. The other thing to remember is don't rush it. If you go nice and slow, it tends to track a lot better, particularly as the blade gets a little bit duller. Once the material is resawn, it can be cleaned up on both sides at the thicknesser. The last rough sawn edge on the board is trimmed off while cutting the boards to width. The boards are clamped and glued. Plywood coils are used to distribute the pressure more evenly, so a fewer clamps can be used. Neither end of the board is square, but the long edges are at least straight and parallel with each other. If I had a larger crosscut sled, I would have used that to square up one end first. Instead, I just marked a square line for the track saw, then the measurements for the other end can be taken from there. The standard jointing process takes place for the stock for the legs. These legs are all rift sawn grain, and I have a separate video on why you may want rift sawn grain for table legs and what that looks like. To rip stock in a single pass on my one and three quarter horsepower saw, I've installed a rip tooth saw blade. Cleanup and final sizing is done at the thicknesser, bringing the 45 mm stock down to the final 40 mm square. While the rip blade is installed, the rail stock is also processed. It'll end up being 40mm tall, but 20mm thick. For the smaller apron pieces, crosscut sled is no problem whatsoever. Unfortunately, I've made my crosscut sled a little bit too small, so for these larger pieces, the stop ends up being about 20mm too far to the right. So how do I cut these pieces accurately? I'm gonna use a stop on my table saw fence. I can square one in, just like I did with the small pieces, butt it up against this stop on my fence and make the cut. You'll notice the stop does not get anywhere near the start of the saw blade. That's so I can use this as a reference stop, but I'm not riding up against it. If I ride up against that or the fence, while I'm making the cut, there is a good chance that it could bind and that'll result in kickback and a very bad day all around. In my case, the stop block is just a piece of 18 millimeter plywood that is clamped to the table saw fence. To get the length I need, I go over, in this case, 380 millimeters plus the width of the stop block, 18 millimeters. So I'm reading uh, 498 millimeters on the table saw fence.
The layout for joinery on the legs is super important and it's one of those things that I find myself always double checking because I'm not quite sure whether I've got it right or wrong. What I like to do is gang all four legs together, clamp them together, and I can draw on top the actual layout of uh, where these legs will sit in the final piece. Typically, I'll take a marker, draw a square in the center where the four legs meet, and in this case, I'm drawing an L or an S indicating the long apron or the short apron and how that fits in with the layout. By orienting the text in the same direction, uh, there's only one way that all the text is the correct way up and the square meets up in the corner. So it's a lot easier to do the actual layout for where all the mortises will go. I'll be using the Festool Domino for the joinery, but the layout process is the same whether using dominoes, traditional mortise and tenon or dowels. A saddle square, like this one from Veritas, makes transferring lines around corners for mortises on each leg a real cinch. I didn't show milling the jarra for the vertical styles because that was all from reclaimed material, which was mostly a laborious process of removing varnish. The dominoing of the styles is the same process as the apron pieces, just with a smaller bit. If you're using regular mortise and tenon, leave your stock a little bit longer and cut the tenon at the table saw. Both the top and bottom short apron pieces will receive matching mortises for the vertical styles. These are centered on the aprons. With the joinery cut, the bottom and middle long aprons receive a quarter inch dado for the shelves, which I'll get to later. This has to be cut before the curves. The species of wood I'm using for this project is Victorian ash. Victorian ash is a eucalypt or a gum tree, and gum trees are notorious for having sap veins all through them, like this one. Sap veins can be very bad, they can be a structural issue, but in the case of these pieces, it's just visual. Some people hate the look of sap veins and will dismiss the piece outright. Some, like me, don't mind them too much, gives it a little bit of character, but they are a bit of a problem where dust can settle when they're not sealed. I treat sap veins like I would a crack in wood. If it's a very deep structural crack, I'll fill it with epoxy, but if it's just a very shallow superficial crack, or in this case sap veins, I'll fill it with CA or superglue. I tend to use a medium viscosity CA, this one is 600 CPS, because I find that's a good compromise between getting into all the cracks and getting a fair bit of coverage down. So once that's dried, I'll sand it back and if it needs a subsequent coat because any bubbles or anything have been exposed, I'll do another coat then. I tend not to use accelerator because that can cause those bubbles to form uh, prematurely. Other than the structural strength that epoxy can give you, it is pretty similar to CA in this sort of application. Uh, CA wins out because it dries quicker in my books. With all the joinery done, now I can add some decorative detail into the lower aprons. Go from this square apron to a slightly curved apron. Using a scrap of 9mm plywood, cut to 40mm wide to match the width of the rail, but about 50mm longer at either end of the length of the aprons, I measure up the height I want for my arc. Then I partially drive a couple of nails into where the ends of the aprons will come to. This lets me flex a metal ruler to let me draw my arc out. The template can then be trimmed to length and the curve cut out of the bandsaw. The 
The curve is refined using a flexible hand sander. Being just 9mm thick plywood, this goes quickly enough and there isn't a real need for power tools here. The apron and template can be clamped onto this jig, which is basically a mini version of the tapering jig from the other week, without the miter runner. The flush trim bit bearing rides up against the arc template, very quickly removing material. This type of jig is much quicker than using double sided tape. Unlike the apron pieces, the legs are going to stay perfectly straight. This is going to be a small taper at the bottom. This taper goes from the 40mm square of the leg down to about 32mm, tapering just on two of the faces. There are plenty of ways to taper something like this. Commonly you could use a hand plane, a hand saw, a band saw, or even a jointer. But to me, I think the table saw is probably the best way because you can get very clean results very, very quickly and by using a jig like this, which I've shown in a previous episode how to build, using the stops on it means that I can get the same taper on all the legs by just marking out one of them, then use the stops to position everything. the panels that will make up the two shelves in the side table, it's gone through the exact same process as it did for the top. That is, I've jointed one face, jointed one edge, and run the other face through the thicknesser so that I've got three sides square and jointed. So now I'm gonna resaw 12 mil off because it's a shelf, it doesn't need to be quite as thick, which will leave me with a jointed face on both the keeper piece and the offcut piece. On the offcut piece, that'll go through the thicknesser again so that both surfaces, or both faces, sorry, are jointed. And I can do the final resource, I'll have three pieces, all of them with at least one face that has been jointed, making it much, much quicker. I find I often get a tiny bit of snipe when jointing shorter length boards, but that's quickly cleaned up with a hand plane. Jointing both sides at the same time, it doesn't matter if I put an angle on it, as they'll cancel out and be flat once folded out. Once trimmed to size, the panels get a rebate to fit into the dados cut in the apron pieces. The show side, that is the face that will be seen from the top of the shelf, is face down. Before glue up, all parts are sanded up to 180 grit. I use the pencil method for knowing when I've sanded it enough. Scribble some lines, sand until the lines are gone, and you're done. I find it much easier to apply finish before glue up rather than after, particularly with this hard wax oil, as it's easy to do a few touch-ups after glue up if needed. I've talked about this finish before, I apply just two coats, rolling it on with a microfiber roller. If I can break a project into smaller sub-assemblies, I always try to. In this case, I'll be gluing up the short sides as sub-assemblies so that the overall glue up is less stressful. As this will only ever be indoors, liquid hide glue is my go-to for hassle-free glue ups. It won't stain the wood like PVA, it'll stick to itself if I get it in the wrong mortise, and it helps lubricate the joints for easier assembly. Glue is squeezed into each mortise and brushed onto the walls of the mortise. The dominoes can be easily inserted by hand, for the most part. A mallet coaxes the top apron into proper alignment, and the additional orange clamp pulls the bottom rail and stiles up nice and tight. This is the downside of using the domino on the slightly wider setting, there is often a little bit too much wriggle room.
I was just about to glue this up, I'm just doing the final dry fit now, and I've realized I've almost made a very big mistake. I haven't made any allowances for hardware for attaching the top. I like to use these Z clips, and they require just a little channel in the apron pieces to put one end in and then it pulls the top down. I'll go into why you want to have this sort of hardware or some alternatives for attaching a table rather than gluing it on in a another episode, but now I need to cut those slots. My preference is with the Domino because it's the right size for it, five millimeters, but you can do the same job with a biscuit jointer, which I don't have in two passes, or a plunger at will make those slots just as easily. They'll just be a little bit oversized, which really isn't a problem. The second stage of the glue up is the long aprons and shelves. While waiting for the short sides to dry, I glued in the dominoes to the long aprons. I like to work within my own levels of dumb, so by pre-gluing in one side of the dominoes, I've got a much lower chance of forgetting to put glue in the mortise. The shells are floating, they do not get glued in. I found these parallel clamps have enormous clamping pressure, so some scrap wood makes a good call not to dent the wood. After the glue is dried with the table upside down on the tabletop, I can put the Z clip in the slot and mark where I need to drill. Ideally, you don't want this to be completely bottomed out in the slot or touch the sides so that there is plenty of room for movement. The frame can be removed so that a pilot hole is drilled to a set depth. Flipping the frame back onto the tabletop, the clips can be screwed into position. That was a really fun build to do. Relatively small furniture, but it was really nice to sink my teeth into solid wood again. I haven't deliberately made mission style furniture before, so this was nice to sort of take influences from a set sort of design. There are a few things I would change if I was building it for me. I'd like to have a very slight taper to the underside, so maybe 10-ish degrees uh, chamfer all the way around isn't to my mum's liking, so that doesn't really matter from my point of view. It is for her after all. I think this type of furniture, the mission style, is all about getting those subtle details right rather than trying to overdo it. I think I've pulled it off okay with the contrast with the Jarrah and Vic Ash, and I think those curves on the bottom rails are just enough. There's probably a few other bits and pieces I'd do in the future, but this is a good stepping stone for me for future design inspiration and things like that. Remember there are a set of free plans, it uh, contains the cut list, dimensional drawings, but it is just a PDF, there's no SketchUp or Fusion diagram going along with that. Really fun to go into a deep dive build again, so hopefully there'll be more of those in the new year. Thanks for watching.